can I ask you, Alexandrina, from a, from a sort of perspective of a, of a Russian abroad, how did it strike you? Well, I was, um, I was thinking a lot about uh, how these people who are still warm, you know, had their families, their children, their grandchildren, and for, for them, they were not that bad people, or they would never give it, would look at them in this sense. And I was thinking that in the contemporary Russia, when, uh, when we are speaking about corrupted regime and people who serve <laughs> corrupted regime who are part of that, but they also are thinking about themselves, that they are just playing the rules, that in spite they probably think about trying to justify what's happening, and they see that everything around is the same and they're just playing by those rules. So they're probably are not the same as these pe people from the stories of whose we were um, hearing now. In contemporary Russia, they, always, they also don't think that the question is that this is the country which in Putin's and his surrounding vision requires this kind of um, way of what, what, what do you mean it requires? Um, that um, recently many people think that we are experienced, we are glo we are getting close to to the um, situation which is similar to Stalin's the, the return time. Of the Soviet Union. In different senses, that like Putin is often compared with Stalin. At the same time, um, lots of art centers streets are named by Stalin or the name of Stalin is return, uh, returned to that. And there is a big debate if it's the right thing to do. And uh, in a way, Putin gives a kind of um, unarticulated blessing and uh, um, allows this to happen. Um, kind uh, of J John Freeman, <coughs> as, a, as an American living in Russia, did you find it, it, it felt relevant? Did it felt fresh? The play? The story, yeah. Oh, it's, it's an extraordinary piece, actually. Um, I, I, I listened to this. I, the first time I encountered it was a couple of years ago. It was at Oxford. I saw the reading there. I, I never saw the performance in Moscow, as it turned out. I just didn't, I, for some reason, I didn't see it. Uh, so this is the second time I've encountered it. and. Um, uh, I found myself despairing as I listened to this piece. I found myself experiencing genuine despair uh, because one, clearly this is a, one of the things I love about this piece is that it p points no fingers whatsoever. It has no answers. It does not say somebody is guilty, somebody <coughs> is innocent. It doesn't mess with that at all. It messes with what it what it messes with is with life, and with the reality of a life that people live for decades. Um, uh, any one of us can dig back into our own pasts and find uh, difficult moments that we rationalize. It so happens that the people that lived in the Soviet Union had perhaps a more difficult life to rationalize than other. And so this piece is. Uh, I, again, I'm going to use the word uh, rather uh, a, a piece. That, that it's not a despairing piece, but it is a piece that causes me to experience despair because I see the same thing happening right now. Because other people around me are doing the very same thing. They're finding the exact same excuses. They're finding the exact same uh, answers to the to the to the similar questions. Uh, when I say people around me, I, I should perhaps say very briefly that I work in the theater. I indeed was a theater critic for 25 years at the Moscow Times. I'm a translator. Um, I now work for a theater called the Stanislavski Electro Theater in, in, in Moscow. And around me, I see people knuckling under, buckling under. I see people making excuses. I see people making the choice that will help them keep their career going, but you know, there are a few, a, a few, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll support this, I'll support that, I'll keep quiet about this. Uh, it's a very, very difficult situation to be in. And uh, so as I listen to this piece about history, about almost ancient history, <laughs> uh, 
uh, I sense that it is a return. It is a. It is a. It is kind of a, a, a new approach to the life that I'm actually living right now. <laughs> Oliver, can I ask you, as a sort of somebody who observes Russia from from afar? I mean, you, you travel, uh, and, but somebody from from an outside perspective, did it feel like commentary on the past or the present? Well, I don't know. I was reading. I read an article today which said the difference between Britain and Germany in terms of our attitude to our past is that in Britain we're proud of our past and in Germany they define themselves against their past. I think the, a lot of the problem in Russia is that there was a, you can't say it that simply, particularly with regard to the Second World War, which is the defining sort of myth of everyone's, of everyone's upbringing, is that people are proud of it, but people are also aware that what went alongside it is very difficult. And um, actually one of the places referred to in Tar, which is where the gentleman's grandfather had been in charge of the camp, and in fact where Alexander Daniel, Daniel's um, relatives had been as well. Um, I, I went there when I was researching my second book to try and track down a, a stories about someone who'd, who'd been in a camp there. And, and it's, it is an absolute gulag town. Everything about it, it would not have existed without the gulag. It is a coal mining town. Everyone who lives there is either had been in the gulag or is descended from someone who was in the gulag. There is the, it is the ultimate place that would have a sort of resistance myth against the Soviet Union within it, and it doesn't have it at all. If you go to the, the town museum, it, it, it says, you know, in huge letters that the, vic the victory in the Soviet war was built in the gulag too, which is, which is a lie. Um, you know, the people in the gulag were starved to death, and they were, you know, essentially their, their, their sentences were extended indefinitely for the duration of the war. They weren't fed. They were being, these were people who were put in prison after the war just for having been prisoners of war. It was, it was you know, this, this all-conquering story of the pride in the Second World War is so important that it makes it very, very hard, I think, to, to tell another story. And, and so when I hear this, I, I met an awful lot of people of that generation um, who, who found it very difficult to tell stories about, about the gulag and about that because they didn't want to betray this triumph that, that they take so much pride in. And I, th I think it's, it's very important to sympathize with that as well as to condemn it. The, that, that it, this is something people take tremendous pride in. And, and, and I think just it's, it's in a way quite simplistic now to look back on it and say, well, they, they, they should have stood up to it, they should have condemned it, because people need stories to, to, to live their life by, and everyone needs something to make sense of their lives. And, and I think that, that you, you have to have something to take pride in, you can't, otherwise you can't function. And I think that that is the difficulty that Russia has, and, uh, and, and it's I think it came out incredibly well today, that, that these, these people, were very proud of having built the country. They were proud of, of, of where they lived and proud of the fact that they were peasant kids who'd, who'd achieved so much. And it's very difficult to say, but at the same time I did these terrible things because you don't want to, to admit that. I, I think that was <coughs> one of the really strong things about it was this nuance um, and that sort of partly came out through, through opposing family ties with big historical uh, acts of, of brutality. Um, but wha one of the things that came out towards the end a lot was this idea of process of reckoning as hasn't happened in Russia, lustration, it was something we talked about the Nuremberg trials, uh, one of the quotes that I scribbled down was, one of the main reasons why we've ended up where we are is because we never had the Nuremberg trials, there was no lustration. Do you, uh, as, a, as a politician, do you, do, you think that's, do you think that's correct? Do you think that process should have happened in Russia? Well, it's a, it's a difficult uh, topic. Um, and um, we see now this resurgence of uh, mass sort of uh, support for, for Stalin. Um, and uh, I don't think the, the Russian people can be blamed for that because, you know, the history of Russia is full of uh, repression and uh, it's very natural that people have this um, sort of desire for a strong uh, head, hand, desire for a strong uh, government. Um, and um, Russian people, after all, after this Soviet uh, times, and f uh, even before that, uh, it uh, Russian uh, sort of society was always under uh, the rule of authoritarianism. Um, uh, but I think the key role is uh, the role that play that government plays. Um, it can um, take steps to bring people closer to to make sense uh, of its history, to be in touch with reality, but uh, Russian government um, over the last 15 years after sort of the brief opening of the 90s when there was a lot of discussion about Stalinist uh, uh, Stalin years, 
Uh, but uh, then the, uh, the government uh, under Putin took, um, uh, took it back and uh, inspired the feelings of xenophobia and uh, imperialism, nationalism in people, and uh, it uh, definitely shows in the way uh, people uh, feel about Stalin now. And yet, it's not a it, it's not an unnuanced process again because they've they've just opened up a big um, gulag museum. I, I understand in Moscow. I haven't been there myself. I don't know if you have. Joe. I have not yet. No. no. Um, but my understanding from people who have been there is that it, it's it doesn't shy away from from what the gulags were. So, uh, do you feel like pe people talk? Um, and John, you're, I think you're the only person in this on this panel who actually was resident in Russia. So I'm going to come back to you as our sort of. Uh, are expert on on these matters. People talk about a, a resurgence of the cult of Stalin in Russia. Do you think that's overblown? No, I don't think that's overblown. Um, and I also want to quickly say just one thing about the uh, the uh, Gulag Museum. Um, this Gulag muse Museum may indeed pose some some difficult questions and may bring out some themes that aren't usually brought out. But let's keep in mind that these I guarantee you these people have a hell of a fight keeping that, opening the museum, and they'll have a hell of a fight keeping it open. So uh, let's not, let's not, let's not <laughs> assume that because a museum like this opens in Moscow, that that means that there is room for that kind of talk in Moscow. There probably isn't room, and there will be people pushing hard on them soon. <laughs> I have no doubts about that. Not having been to the museum yet, I have no doubts about that. The, um, uh, Yes, I feel a very strong resurgence in uh, uh, specifically the, 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 the cult of Stalin um, because I don't hear conversations about Stalinism. I don't hear, I mean, deep, long intellectual uh, conversations, political. What I see are people using the name of Stalin, using the picture of Stalin, and just using it as a, as a sign, saying, this is good, this is strong. This is part of the Russia that I want to be a part of. You have a, you know, three or four in the last two years, three or four, maybe even five, statues and busts around Russia having been erected. Uh, just recently, a museum, a Stalin museum, was opened up in Perm. <laughs> Perm is the city where uh, Sevalid Meyerhold, the great Russian director, was born and grew up. And Stalin killed Meyerhold. The fact that you have a museum, a Stalin museum, in the city where several of Meyerhold was born is absolutely insane. It's asinine. And uh, I don't think there's anybody actually asking hard questions. I really don't believe that. Uh, the Stalin is a figure. He's a, he's a sign that is being used. <laughs> this is our greatness. This is power. And people are running to that for, for whatever reasons. I'm not going to pass judgment on people right now. But as I a fact, that's, yeah. I mm -hmm. would also add the, like the way how history is taught in schools, how Stalin is presented in their <laughs> school history books. It's another illustration. Museum is a one thing. It's not, it doesn't influence mass culture and mass perception of the Stalin's role as much as books, films, and like mass propaganda, which is which has much more influence on the... Talking of books and films, and, and, and there, there was a lot of talk of censorship in this, in this play. Um, where are we at in Russia on that front? Um, and th this play, Noah, correct me if I'm wrong, but this play's been on in Russia, right? There's, yes. there's no problem with that. that you, you take it around, it tours. But it's very small theater. It was um, like in theater for maybe 100 or 200 people, right? <laughs> As a result of putting that on, or as a result of their general editorial, that's no no Burke's yeah, yeah. He's the, the he translated the play and, and is uh, the director of the <laughs> Sputnik Theatre. Um, <coughs> what, what's your feeling, Vladimir? Where, where we're at uh, in the sort of intersection of, um, of of arts and politics in Russia and, and censorship, maybe even self censorship. What's the state of the arts? Well, we know that uh, all um, TV channels are, are controlled by state, and there is a very heavy censorship. And uh, actually, it's used as a tool for propaganda, especially it has been very uh, blatant in this Ukrainian campaign over the last uh, year and a half. Um, and uh, we see that this censorship is creeping into the arts world. We 
Um, th there's a famous example of a play, Tangazer, which was um, uh, shut staged, down uh, sh shut down in, in uh, Novosibirsk. And uh, I think in, in the last few days, there was talk, the, the uh, Minister of Culture was saying that from now on, uh, all new plays, all modern plays, have to be vetted by some special committee within uh, the ministry before being uh, put on stage. Another famous um, story which was widely discussed, uh, Marat Gelman's gallery, who was ordered to leave uh, one of the probably first gallery, contemporary galleries in Russia, which was open maybe <coughs> around 20 years ago. So recently he was ordered to leave Vinzavod because he had some kind of art auction um, trying to raise funds for um, political prisoners. And um, this was a big discussion and scandal about that with the director of Vinzavod wrote a letter asking him to leave within few few days. You have quite an interesting story, uh, Alexandrina Markov, with, together with Vladimir, because Vladimir's a politician and, and you were involved in the arts and um, you eventually ha had a, you, you have an open uh, court case against you in Russia connected to your work in the arts, which you believe is, is motivated because of Vladimir's political activities. Like, can, can you just give us a very brief description of what happened? Well, I personally was never involved in politics anyhow. My, <laughs> my only connection is Vladimir Ashulkov, my partner. I, my entire life I was um, involved in different arts projects. I was running a company which was organizing exhibitions, festivals, like to give just a few ideas, I was organizing an exhibition of Norman Foster in Pushkin Museum with Jan Westwood show in Kazansky Railway Station, lots of uh, different books, uh, festivals, and other events. For like more than 15 years, maybe I was doing that. Since I uh, met Vladimir and uh, we uh, became partners, uh, quite quickly mm, our life changed. <laughs> we had a our apartment was raided. Um, it was in 2000. Once in 2013 and then once in 2014, just before we left uh, Russia. Well, and um, when we left Russia, we... <laughs> well, basically, um, our story is, is uh, quite simple. Uh, in uh, There was a lot, th there was a, a, a sense of escalation of repressions in the beginning of 2014 after the annexation of Crimea, and um, uh, Navalny was put under house arrest, our apartment was raided and, and uh, by the police, and the uh, video footage from that raid was shown on the same uh, evening on uh, national TV in a defamatory video. So, um, well, conveniently, we planned to be in London in May of um, that year, um, because our son was uh, was due to be born uh, in uh, London. Um, and uh, a week after he was born, a criminal case was opened against me and uh, two, two of my associates. Uh, it was a politically motivated case. Um, and uh, soon thereafter, I filed for political asylum, which I got last year. And bizarrely, in December of uh, 2014, a separate uh, criminal case was opened against um, Sasha. Um, basically, the allegation was that um, she stole some of the government money um, that her company received um, for uh, organizing the book fairs for Moscow government. So between ourselves, we, we joke that we probably are the only family where there is a separate uh, politically motivated uh, criminal cases against each of us. <laughs> well done, you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Oliver, do, from, from your impressions uh, of, uh, of the people that you speak to and other, other writers and people <coughs> involved in the arts, do you feel like <coughs> things are changing? Because uh, for a long time it seemed to be the case that in Russia, uh, so long as you didn't touch politics, you, you, could, you could pretty much 
you, you could you, you could say you want to be to be very outspoken. Do you think that's changing now? Well, I, d I mean, it does seem to be pretty miserable. Has to be said. Um, in Moscow, I don't know. I'm admittedly most of the time of late, I've been in Kiev, and it's very interesting hearing this because in, in Kiev, if you want, you can go into the the old KGB building. There's a, a little room at the side full of computers. Um, no one else. I mean, there's two very bored archivists who work in there because no one ever goes in there. And you can go in and sit at the terminal and type in anything you want. And there you go. There is the KGB archives. You know, that did look at it. No one does, but you can if you want. And um, I, I don't think they go up to a, a very uh, contemporary level. Because well, I mean, so they go <laughs> up to sort of the. Uh, no, I mean, it, no. The, they the stop at a certain the point. The KGB really. archives, rather than the, 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 the Ukrainian ones. But I mean, it, you know, it's still, you know, it, I mean, I've, I've looked through them and there's more. There's, well, there's more stuff than I could be bothered to look at. And um, <laughs> to put it mildly, and um, and but what's I think what's interesting about what's happening in Ukraine and <coughs> even more so in Georgia is that it's sort of the mirror image of what's happening in Russia. Is there's no real reckoning with the past there either. It's just it's Russia's fault, um, and and I think this is actually part of the problem. In, in Russia, there is a as a sort of they feel very prickly about it because I mean Georgians, it's absurd. You know, be both Beria and Stalin were Georgian, and yet if you talk to Georgians, it's genuinely like they no Georgian ever did anything wrong. They are they were occupied um, by the Russians and who left in 1991, and everything since then has been grand. And 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 to a certain extent, you hear the same thing in Ukraine. Though I mean, it's a bit more a bit more nuanced there. But it, and it's and I think this part of the problem in Russia is people feel nationalist, bizarrely about a Georgian, um, and meanwhile Georgians feel nationalist about him not being, it's very odd, and I think that's part of the problem, I think it's been tied up with, with a sort of Putin against Saakashvili, Putin against Poroshenko dialogue that whereby somehow the Russians ended up on the side of Stalin, I think it's rather unfortunate. Uh, this is sort of idea that it, that it behoves you to, to look at your past um, squarely in the face seems like a good moment to open up to some questions from the floor. Yes, you, you sir, over there. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can, you can hear me, all right. Uh, I, I can, can, but someone else is probably louder. Yeah, yeah. 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 James, James Thacker, American author. Um, in fact, we were in, I was involved at 18 years of the Sikushki in Russia um, during the Soviet period of index censorship. Um, question of historical memory, which he was referred to, which is what this is about, and I'm a huge admirer of Todd Lanzmann. He spent years and years uh, finding witnesses, hundreds of them, and winnowing it down just to a few, because those were the ones that told the story. Now, this is the first time I've heard historical memory dealt with by, in this way by relatives. It's very, very powerful, extraordinary, really, the only other way than witnesses. And I wonder what the selection process was. Um, we just had a few people here being mentioned, but I mean, there must have been hundreds of people that they could have chosen. And the way you choose them shapes the argument completely. And I was trying to understand how the argument was being shaped by the choice of the, of the relatives. I, I, I would give that question to one of the panel, but actually, can I give it to, to Noah yeah, over there? Yeah. Because he can, he can answer your question. Um, I, I could probably say a little bit about that. I mean, unfortunately, we don't have the playwrights to answer for Fili, but obviously I have discussed that with them. So they were very keen to um, include the testimony of people who were um, condemned the Stalinist period um, and were quite liberal in their views precisely because of the conflict they would therefore have you know, with their own relatives. They were actually um, a tendency to forgive their own relatives um, and not, uh, not people who were still pro-Stalinist. Um, pro, <laughs> pro um, there was quite a personal, some, some sometimes personal reasons for the selections. Um, well, you know, one, one character is the wife uh, of um, one of the co-authors and um, I think that, yeah, it, it was essentially that, that that was the idea, to find those people who, th there was an inner conflict within them. Um, yeah. Okay, so, so, they, so the, the writers consciously selected people who, who had conflict, who, who were in conflict with their parents or, or grandparents' choices, which obviously <laughs> um, makes good drama as well as quite apart from anything else. Thank you. Any, anyone else got a question? Yes, you. My name is Sigrun Davidsdottir, I'm an Atlantic a journalist. Um, well, first of all, thank you for this absolutely fascinating performance uh, to those who were here earlier. But uh, considering that we have two Russians on the stage now, I was just wondering if you had any similar stories in your families, if there was some reflection or echoes of your own stories. Vladimir. 
Yeah, um, this this play is a, a, a powerful collection of memories, and uh, my personal story um, is that I, I'm probably one of rare people whose family wasn't directly touched by the repressions, so w not much was talked about uh, this uh, in my childhood. But then um, at the age of about, so, so I knew about the personality cult, cult личности, but what was taught at school, so from the history books, from the Soviet history books. But then um, when after Perestroika started and uh, at the probably 14, 15, I um, started reading everything that I could get my hands on the literary magazines, the books that published works of Solzhenitsyn, Shalamov that described this uh, whole period. And um, I, uh, of course, I turned anti Stalinist. But I remember when I was 18 at the university, I remember having discussions with my um, friends. And uh, I was saying, well, of course, Stalin was bad, but um, Lenin was a good guy, he had good intentions, so, and only later I realized the full extent of the, um, the impact that Soviet rule from its beginning had on, on Russian society. So it took me years to, um, to make sense of history. And in the same way, the Russian society uh, will probably take a lot more than any individual person to make sense of its own history. What about you, Alexandrina? Have you got well, my mm, my grandfather's brother was um, killed, or in, was imprisoned and killed uh, during uh, Stalin's time. Um, well, what I remember, what my parents and my pa grandparents uh, talked to me, they always, and between themselves, I my feelings from my childhood that was that they never had those illusions and they never, like, my mom was telling me when Stalin uh, died, um, she was a young girl, a little girl, and she remembered that her mother sat like silently in the, not silently, but like sister in the family breakfast that tyrants died. Right. So she came to, my mom went to school where everyone was crying, teachers, children, and it was discussed as a big tragedy, and that was on the street, but she knew that among their family friends, they all had a kind of system of signs of exchange, this mm -hmm. understanding, okay, it happened finally. And, and do you think in that uh, your family was, was a minority family? Uh, I think all Russian intelligentsia, they more or less uh, were part of the same kind of sharing the same vision and feelings. I think by that time already many people understood that they could not speak openly about that, but this was what my parents told me. Any more? Yes, yes, you. Um, yes, I'm Van de Grace and um, I'm a writer and um, an actress and uh, I think the, um, the, the complexity of the history of Russia um, has to be um, sort of appreciated. This piece has to be put in the context. And I think even th the enormity of the Russian Revolution, which, um, you know, we can't really, uh, what we've had in England and, you know, is just what the Russian people have gone through, the enormity of that. Um, and I think we can't underestimate that. And. Stalingrad, I mean, the Russian people should be proud. They won the Second World War. I don't think here we've given credit over um, what they went through. And I think um, what I do think is really interesting, and I'd like to ask now, we have these um, oligarchs, or a lot of these ex-KGB pe people who come here now with their ill-gotten gains while we have people in Russia who are starving and we have this situation here where they can't be extradited. There's huge crime um, going on now. So um, I think that's another, uh, and it just makes me feel, as, as was mentioned, that I, I despair for the Russian people, really, because it just seems like one enormous chapter, and then... As it happens, Oliver's 
Uh, yeah, no, don't get me started. I, I've, um, I, I mean, on the note of the Russians winning the Second World War, they, they defeated Hitler. I'm not sure they won. I think if they won, they would have ended up living better than they'd started. Um, I think that the tr their tragedy is that they lost the Second World War. Their, their government won. Um, I think the Russians ended up very badly off in the after the Second World War, in fact, almost worse off, and which I think is, is one of the great problems with their coming to terms with the Second World War. Also, um, that it never was analyzed or discussed. Or yes. It I mean, with regard to the oligarchs, I completely agree with you. The idea that, and it, I mean, not just Russians, I mean, from all, all, uh, all over the world, I mean, the idea that sort of Maxim Bakiev is, is, is living in, in Britain and, and could claim, try and claim asylum here is, is absurd. But there you go. I mean, you know, we, the, the strength of our country is that we don't send people back without due legal process, and that has its flip side. And um, if you're very rich, you get to um, enjoy that flip side. But you know, there you go. I think I'd rather that than the alternative, to be honest. So I agree. It's it's it Since has. People are living on starvation. We can understand why they always support Stalin or want to send them back. We can understand why they go out to get two separate things in a way. No, no, I I completely agree. I can understand why people are very angry about it, and it makes perfect sense. But I don't think that's an argument to abandon due process, um, with all its flaws in this country, just because they don't have due process in other countries. I, it's something which I'm, yeah, I, I spend a lot of time looking into and, and tracing the money and trying to find out how it is laundered here and how it's spent here. And the, uh, the fact that a Ukrainian oligarch who, who made his entire money from essentially creaming cash off the Ukraine-Russia gas trade managed to buy an ex-tube station for 53.3 million pounds in Knightsbridge is obscene. Um, there's no other way of describing do, it. It's do, do, do you think that, I mean, we, we spend quite a lot of time um, I, in the media in this country and, and uh, on, on this stage talking about how uh, rampant the corruption is in Russia and, and, and how what a detrimental effect that's having not only on the Russian people but generally on global politics. Do you, do you think in, in those kinds of examples that you're raising there that, that we're kind of complicit in that, or at least our governments are, by allowing these people? Yes, of I mean, of course we are. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no question about it. Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure to what extent we're knowingly complicit I think there's a lot of sort of turning a turning a blind eye and saying, oh well, you know. Um, but the international ruling class is. I agree. <laughs> I, yes. Yes, I agree. Yes, you sir over there. Um, <laughs> Hello, my name's John Morrison. I worked in Russia for many years uh, in the Brezhnev period as a journalist, and I also wrote a biography of Boris Yeltsin, and I've written a couple of plays featuring Russian history. Um, I think um, the good thing about this play, um, which folk, most of the people quoted were from a very elite group. Uh, you've got all these mentions of the House on the Embankment, which is the big, and still it, you know, the big uh, government house on the Moscow River where <coughs> all top officials and their families live. So in a way, it's a, an untypical cross-section, but I think the moral dilemmas of for, the, uh, for these families were pretty much the same as for large swathes of the population. And whoever it was said, you don't point fingers, is absolutely right, because unlike in Nazi Germany, uh, where there was a fairly clear historical dividing line bef you could draw between the perpetrators and the victims. In Russia, with 70 years of Soviet history, the victims and the perpetrators have been huge. They're the same people. And so it's very hard to point fingers at who is guilty. And so you get this complex of collective, not so much collective guilt as collective innocence, where it's just very, very difficult to get to grips with. I would say that um, having lived a little bit through the, the period of perestroika and what came after, there was this period where there was a short-lived attempt to get to grips with Russian history and Soviet history and find out the truth. A sort of, ger uh, you know, in German they call it um, overcoming the past, Vergangenheitsbewältigung. Uh, um, it didn't work, and it people moved on, it was all too difficult. And I think the moment has passed. I, don't, I think it's too late now for 
because everybody died for Russia to really get to grips with uh, this period of history. I, I'd like to ask the two Russians on the panel whether they agree that the men fought for us. Oh, um, one of the inspirations for me when I, when I uh, got involved in uh, politics was this idea of trying to bring closer the time when the government will serve its uh, purpose of sort of nudging the, the people uh, towards uh, making sense of its history and, and uh, moving towards you know, the European values of um, democracy and, uh, and freedom. And uh, I think that um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite confident that this time will come and uh, it probably will come sooner than many people um, think. And um but, but specifically on looking at the past, Alexandria, yeah, do, do, do you think the moment's past? Excuse me. I pardon. think it's never too late. And I think the like, contemporary current and the tragedy of Russia is that it never happened. Maybe I agree with you that those attempts were made. Uh, they never was good enough. And um, they just stop doing that. And it I seems think to be the implication of what you were saying was that the, the attempts came too late, that it was already too no, mixed but up. I you, think you it's uh, there is no question that some people are already dead. It's uh, even to explain to our children, to people of my generation, to, to learn those uh, lessons of history, to make the right accents, even for memory of like almost every family in Stalin's time lost someone or some families were killed, but there was no like I think all people whom I know, they, they lost either one grandmother or grandfather in the camps or, so this is for memory of these people who were killed by Stalin's regime. This should be mm, the right memorial, the right kind of stories and um, discussion analysis of this situation for a future and, and for and sake of the future of generation. There is a set up for this dedication yeah, well, <laughs> we, we've got a comment. We have uh, Yelena Gremina tonight with us, who is the uh, artistic director of Teatr Dok, one of the most persecuted um, theatres in Russia, and she's come for these four days for, for the series um, uh, to, to be present here. She spoke uh, on a uh, panel uh, on Tuesday, but um, listening to what we've been discussing, she, she'd like um, to say a few words, and I'll probably have to translate. Ну, тема коллективной вины и коллективного искупления очень меня волнует, потому что это имеет прямое отношение к тому общественному расколу, который сейчас существует в России и который все усугубляется и усугубляет. So I, I have a great uh, interest, personal interest in the theme of uh, collective guilt and collective innocence because I believe that this contributes to the um, um, sort of the separation, the crack b in the society in Russia. И тут действительно вот девушка, которая выступала, она упомянула Октябрьскую революцию, но может быть это это все началось не в тридцатые годы, когда мы уже видали вот эти плоды. Все это началось гораздо раньше, может быть, если так говорить генеалогию, это еще так сказать с как бы отмена крепостного права в России, которая только в XIX веке в конце произошла, и общественные борьбы вокруг этого, и первых революционных вот этих выступлений. Um, as, as the lady here in the second row mentioned, um, the revolution um, in, um, in the early 20th century, but most likely um, this whole uh, kind of revolution protest movement has started not in the 30s, but much earlier, probably um, when the serf, uh, serfdom was um, um, abolished. Emancipation, thank you, yes. So, so kind of late uh, 19th century, um, that's probably when, when the protest uh, has really begun. Я бы не стала сравнивать вот это с ситуацией в Германии, где все достаточно было просто, скорее это похоже на французскую революцию 18 века, когда вчерашние судьи и вчерашние жертвы встречались потом у гильотины. 
So I wouldn't compare the situation in, um, in Russia with what happened in Germany. Rather, I would, if there is any parallel, I would draw it with uh, France and uh, the revolution there in the 18th century when uh, both uh, the perpetrators and um, uh, the, uh, the innocent people have all um, kind of met at the guillotine. В сталинский террор как раз э, сегодня человек осуждал э, кого-то, завтра он сам становился жертвой этого террора. Поэтому э, вот эта вот история, что сегодня ты палач, завтра ты жертва, на природе сталинского террора как раз очень хорошо можно изучать. So again, uh, during the Stalin um, era, um, the, the, the terror was that um, today you might... Um, uh, denounce somebody, or you you might write, you know, what are they called? Um, the, the play mentions snitch, snitching somebody, and but uh, the, the, the day after, somebody else can turn on you. So uh, one day, um, so the, the, the sort of uh, situation when uh, it's difficult to differentiate who is the innocent, who is the guilty, um, uh, and and that's where really the the problem lies. Мы к семнадцатому году, к значит, столетию революции, мы делаем большой проект в театре документальный. Мы исследуем родословные людей, потому что каждый русский человек, если он расскажет просто историю своих прадедушек и прабабушек, это просто ну, история ну, практически врагов, потому что у каждого есть в, в роду те, кто друг, друг друга просто убил, если вы встретите. So um, to mark, to commemorate the centenary of the 17th, uh, 1917 revolution, we are in Teatr Dok, uh, we are preparing, uh, creating a project which is going to be based on families. Okay, can you tell us about it? We're just going to see it. So... So we just... <laughs> We are taking random people, all sorts of people, and um, we look at, at their lineage, we look at their, um, uh, their grandparents and great-grandparents, and uh, we can see that th these stories, this, this project is going to be basically the story of the enemies, because in all the, in all the families there would be people who, who, who would turn against each other. Последняя вот какая-то история, например, про человека, которым я, я стал работать там просто ну, в театре, потом выясняется, что родословно у него такая. Он родился, ну, это человек где-то ему лет, наверное, 60 с лишним сейчас, но он родился в концлагере. Мама его была еврейка, политическая заключенная, а папа его был замначальника колонии, который на этом потом потерял свой пост вот на этой связью и как бы это в общем-то человек ну, в общем он рассказывал что до сих пор там папа уже был пенсионер но ему в глаза все боялись смотреть so basically one of the stories this this person is now 60 years old but he had his his mother was he was born in in the camps and his mother я не запомнил мама мама что his mother was a Jewish lady so she was she was a political uh, prisoner. She she was Jewish, and his in uh, yes, it's um, Article <laughs> Fifty Eight. I don't think it'll help anybody. But she was she was a Jewish lady in the camps, political prisoner, and uh, right. And the father and his father was one of the uh, deputy directors of that camp. So right. So when when the when the uh, this character, was this real person was born, um, the 60-year-old who's, who's now, when he was born, his father lost his position in, in the camp. Right, but, but until the very last moment of his career, until the father, who was the deputy uh, director of the camp, and until his very, very last day at work, until he went on and became a pensioner, people were afraid, frightened to look into his eyes. Последний. Поэтому вопрос, вопрос вот искупления, кто перед, вот, про этого человека, кто перед, вот в его случае, перед кем он, кому должен каяться, если сам, сама его жизнь – это результат вот этого всего чудовищного смешения жертвы палачей. So in this instance, for example, it's, it's, it's a very good example to show, to demonstrate that it's so hard. Like, who, who is this person supposed to see as the enemy? And, and um, uh, uh, it just shows the history of this mix of the perpetrators and of the innocent people. That you, you basically just put your finger on how incredibly complex and nuanced 
this, this whole situation is, and at the risk of um, dragging this thing out a little bit, I would like to ask you a follow-up question. Uh, <laughs> Sophia, we... <laughs> Uh, for the, you, you, you've painted this incredibly nuanced picture, but for those of us um, who either like or need to see things in black and white, can you please just tell us, you made some historical analogies, but can you please just tell us, is it back in the USSR or not? Конечно, нет, потому что нынешнее государство в чем-то, может быть, она гораздо опаснее и гораздо и, так сказать, еще более антинародная, чем был Советский Союз. Of course not, because the current government that we have is much more dangerous and in, in a sense is much more anti-people, anti-state than even the Soviet government. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, uh, that was Yelena Gremina. Thank you. Um, and also to my fellow uh, panelists, uh, Vladimir Ashukov, Alexandrina Markova, Oliver Bullo, uh, and John Friedman. Uh, thank you all. Thanks. 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 Bye. Thank you.